Well, I, I want to bring you back to my home. I, I was musing on this um, a couple of weeks ago. It was about seven, eight years ago. We first came to Fountain. We moved from Castro Valley to, to Pleasanton. And, um, and we had a regular fireplace at our previous home. But at this house, we had what's called a, a wood-burning stove. Now, I, I've never worked with these things before at all. And it was, it was during Christmas, and we wanted to, you know, just kind of have the, a cozy night, watch a movie, turn on the Christmas lights. And so, so I, I went to Rayleigh's, and I bought a Duraflame. Now, if you know anything about Duraflames, you're really not supposed to use those things inside of the wood-burning stove. But I didn't know that. And so we put it in, and I noticed that it's just getting hot, like the fire is, is, is pretty thick, so... I thought, okay, I'm going to open it up and break up the Duraflame a little bit more. And, and then all of a sudden, it started to swirl. You know when a fire swirls, it looks, it looks scary. Right? Anybody see the movie Backdraft? And, and so I was like, hey, Jack, I, I don't know if this thing is okay. And then, and then fire started to come out and leak out of the fireplace. And so I did what any husband would do. I, I Googled what was wrong. Like, why is my stove doing this? And the first thing that it said was never put a Duraflame inside of a wood-burning stove. So uh, what I did was uh, I got nervous, so I went outside because Google said that what it can do is cause a chimney fire. So I went outside to make sure my chimney wasn't on fire. But then they said, if it, if it sounds like a freight train, you're in real trouble, like when you crack that thing open. So how many of you guys know I was terrified to open that door? Like, like, no joke. I, I, it was one of those moments like you're trying to take off a radiator cap of a car that's hot. You're just, you, uh, like, I, I don't know, should I do it real quick? So I just opened it real slow, and all I heard was, Whoa. I'm like, that sounds like a freight train. <laughs> and so, so Jackie is in the background like this, Jesus, 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 right? Like, babe, it's all good. I, it's under control. So I go into the kitchen, and I kind of panic, like, what do I do? I don't know. Should I call the fire department? And so I do what anybody would do. I grab water. And they always say you're not supposed to put water on a fire. I don't know why I did, but I did it, and it worked. So uh, anybody that ever gave me that advice in the past, maybe the kitchen and the pans are a little bit different, but it worked in the wood-burning stove. Praise the Lord. Now, now here, here's the deal. Is, is many of you will never open the door or be afraid to open up the door of a wood-burning stone, uh, stove. But, but I, I want to ask you today, what, a, what door are you afraid to open? Because all of us, sometimes we're afraid to open doors, doors of new possibilities, maybe a new relationship because you got burned on the last couple. Wow. Maybe you're afraid to open up your heart to your spouse for whatever reason. You just, oh, I just don't know if I want to open that door. Maybe it's a new career or assignment. Maybe you're afraid to open the door of a crucial conversation that you've been avoiding. Maybe you're afraid to open the door of your own heart because you're afraid of what you might find. Maybe it's a door of change. Maybe it's, it's even a door of a fresh start. You, you've kind of gotten in a rut and you've gotten comfortable there and, and you're just not sure if you want to open that door. But what if I told you there was a door this Christmas that would eradicate all of your fears? It kind of sounds like a fairy tale. But what if I told you that was true? See, see whether you're a, a follower of Jesus or you're not a follower of Jesus, there's a door that can eradicate all of your fears. And Christmas reveals it to us. It's the door of intimacy with God. See, some of us, we don't want to open that door. Not quite ready to open that door. Some of us as believers, we open the door, but we just don't want to walk into the door. Like, oh, this is the way. Truth in the life. You going in? No. Nope. Stay right here. That's the beauty of, of Christmas and Christianity. You hear me say this all the time, that it's not religion, it's relationship. But I use the word intimacy because our relationships many times uh, in our day have become so distorted. When I say a relationship with God, our minds go so many different directions. Like, like for some of us, our relationships have been really shallow. For others of us, our, our relationships have been dysfunctional. And so, so I don't want to speak about just a relationship with God. I think a, a better word is intimacy with God. Intimacy. Now, intimacy defined, I love this definition. It means to be close, familiar, affectionate, loving, personal, a loving, personal relationship 
with a detailed knowledge or deep understanding of a person. Now, can I just ask you, when, when you read this, do you think about God? Does that reflect your understanding of who he is and what he wants? See, I think sometimes we're afraid of, of being intimate with God, being close to him, even afraid with others, because intimacy requires vulnerability. And a lot of times we just don't want to be vulnerable. You know, probably the most devastating thing about that night when I was afraid to open up that door of my fireplace was the, the next thing I told Jackie after that was, hey, babe, we're not going to tell anybody about this, all right? <laughs> Dead serious. That was like the, the, the next thing that came out of my mouth. And as I said that, the Holy Spirit t- revealed to me in that moment, do you see the brokenness in that statement? Because I was serious. Like, I don't want to be that guy that doesn't know how to work the wood-burning stove. You know, don't tell my father-in-law, please. Do you know what I mean? You don't need to call him. We're fine. Just don't tell anybody. Why? Because I've experienced some brokenness in my life. And I think because of that brokenness, we're afraid to be vulnerable. Because many of us have experienced things like betrayal. We've been wounded relationally. Could be by family, friends, spouse. Could be a leader. If I've ever wounded you, I apologize. I'm not a perfect human being. So if I've offended you, please give like just let me know so I can repent to you. Um, But but maybe you've been wounded. You you put your trust in somebody and and it and it went rogue. Maybe you've been stabbed in your back. You just never saw it going down that particular direction. You thought that marriage was going to continue and it dismantled. You thought the friendship was solid and it wasn't. And then I think sometimes even as a result of our pain, we can almost reflect that on God. Like, God has betrayed us. God, God, why would you let me go through something so difficult? So we don't want to get too close. Some of us were afraid of being falsely accused. I remember it was, I'd just gotten saved. I was serving at our church at the time. Jackie and I were together. It was probably like three years saved. And, uh, and a guy comes up to me in our church and says, hey, man, um, my son said that you shot his friend. I was like, what? Shot his friend. I was like, I didn't shoot anybody. No, man, like, they never forget either. And I know who his son is, right? So I was like, whoa, 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 no, no, no. Like, I didn't shoot anybody. And so, but how many of you guys know that, that, that being falsely accused, it caused you to move a little bit differently? I was like, Jackie, I'm dropping you off in the front of the church. I'm going to park in the back. I'm going to come around the side just to make sure, right? Just totally messes with you. And then later... You know, he's like, dude, I'm so sorry. It wasn't you. I was like, I know it wasn't me. (laughs) You had me like stressed out like you were going to come get me for a year. It's the worst. Trying to walk with Jesus here. And so so others of us, we've been rejected. And some of us, we're going to deal with this during Christmas, right? Like family's coming over, so you're going to put the Bible out, maybe on the toilet, on the kitchen table, so people can see that you got it all together, right? Family's coming over. Maybe, maybe you don't have family, and it feels like a season of rejection. Maybe you're single, and it's the reminder this year of, why am I still single again? And so, so we, we try to act a certain way. We personify certain things. We're afraid of what people are going to think. We have all of these voices in the head of our grandstand you know, speaking, don't do this. You better do this. You better act like this. You better. And then we just find ourselves personifying somebody that we're, we're not. So just don't get too close. Like, I'm going to give you the personification of who I am, but just not really who I am. Some of us have been abused physically, emotionally, mentally, sexually. And so, so to be vulnerable, it just seems like, man, I've been hurting on so many different levels, so many deep levels. It just doesn't even seem possible. How about humiliated? Never forget, I was in the fifth grade at a field trip to my teacher's house. She lived here in Pleasanton. And back then, there was nothing here. Um, <laughs> you guys didn't get that. But it's all good. You'll get it in the car. <laughs> Just saying I'm a little bit older. And, uh, and so, so I remember we were playing football, and somebody threw the ball to me, and there was a big old cow patty. You know what a cow patty is? Google it when you get out of here. I was running, slipped in that cow patty and slid like I was sliding into home, covered my whole side. Everybody laughed at me. I'm still struggling. (laughs) But I'll never forget, everybody was just laughing, and I was a cool kid, so it was really embarrassing. We don't want to be humiliated. Don't get too close, because you might really see. 
Proverbs says it this way, that uh, an offended brother is harder to win than a fortified city. And the, the thing with brokenness is brokenness puts up walls. It's hard to deal with disputes. It's hard to deal with brokenness because we, we erect walls. And walls don't only keep good things out or bad things out. They also keep good things out. Are you guys tracking with me on that? Like, like they just don't keep bad things out. They just don't keep good things out. Sometimes they can keep God out. And this is if you're a follower of Jesus or, or if you're not. If you're not a follower of Jesus, then those walls are simply a chasm of you getting closer to God. You're just, I'm just not sure if I can trust. I'm not even sure if you're real. If you have a relationship with God, those walls can just keep you from getting too close. Because if I get too close, he might pull a job on me. Anybody ever been afraid like that? If I get too close, you might take everything away. Because we have a distorted image of who he is. And so the question today is this, how do we overcome this fear of intimacy with God? Well, Christmas reveals this. So if you're taking notes, I want you to jot this down. The first thing is this, is that God wants intimacy with us. Christmas reveals that God wants it. You know, when I first realized that Jackie liked me and chose me, it was like Christmas. Because I felt like, I was out, like she was out of my league. And so when she was like, yes, I want to be with you. That was just, just her, like, you want, to be, you want to be with me? And sometimes even today, I look at her, I'm like, are you still sure you want to be with me? <laughs> Getting old, like the game is changing a little bit. She still like me. So it just, it just it, it, it's, there's nothing like that feeling. And I think that was the feeling that the shepherds had on the, during that first Christmas. And it says this in Luke chapter 2. It says, and in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. Now, let me just give you a recap on shepherds. Most of us think they're cute, but not back in the day. Back in the day, they were outcasts. They couldn't hold public office. Their testimony would not hold up in court. If they witnessed a murder, they would eradicate the case because they couldn't be trusted. They were looked at as peasants and thieves. Many times they were hired to graze people's sheep, and they would take them grazing for a couple of months really far away so the sheep could have babies, so they could sell the babies, sell the milk, and sell the wool. They were the lowest of lowest. One scholar says it this way, that there was no lower occupation than a, than, than a shepherd. And so... So here are these shepherds, they, 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 not only were they outcasts of society, but they couldn't step foot in the synagogue or the church if they wanted to. Nobody wanted to be close to them. Definitely nobody wanted to be intimate with them. Yet moments, yet, yet, yet at this moment as this proclamation of a savior being born is brought not to the prominent, not to the kings, not to queens, not to the religious elite, but to shepherds. Shepherds who could never come close to God, even if they wanted to. So what to do? God came close to them. Wow. See, Christi Christianity is, is different than every other religion. Every other religion will say there's, there's no way that God will come to you. You have to come to God on your own merits, on your own skills, on your own abilities. There's no way that God would stoop to man's level and meet with him. And Christianity is totally different. Christianity said, I know you couldn't get to me, so I'm going to come to you. I am the God of all creation, declaring that I see your brokenness. It matters to me, and I want to be close to you. In fact, Isaiah said it this way. He said, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives, and release from darkness the prisoners. Now, this doesn't sound like somebody that's unhealthy for society. This doesn't sound like somebody that's hostile as sometimes our world portrays Jesus to be. This is the beautiful reality is that God, the God of all creation, is concerned about our brokenness, about our fallen state, about our imprisonment. And 500 years before Jesus even came, the prophet Isaiah was saying, this is his motive, intimacy with you, healing, restoration. He wants to be close. So God shows up in his glory. A lot of times this is what we think about when we think about glory, just but can I just tell you, glory in the scripture is so much more than light. It's not less than, but it's more than. It's weight. The word glory, it means weight in the Greek. And when the weight of God shows up, he restructures things. He says, no, no, I know that you guys have deemed these guys invaluable, but they are valuable to me. 
things change. But they're terrified. They're terrified because they're in the glory of God. Like the glory of God is exposing everything. When I was, when we first got married, Jackie loves to sleep in a, a, a well-made bed. I can get into a bed, throw a sheet over, and I'm good. Jackie likes it to be properly made. So in the beginning of our marriage, she don't do this anymore, praise the Lord. But in the beginning of our marriage, she would come in, she would turn on the light, and then she would strip the covers off. And I'm like, just sleep in here. <laughs> and so when she would do that, it's the most vulnerable thing, right? You're cold. You're like, what are you doing? You're in a sleep. Like, oh, I'm just making the bed. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> kind of sleeping in it. Um, but but the, 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 the thing that I remember the most is just being exposed. I mean, I could have clothes on, but I could still just feel like, where's the covers? Like, and so when the glory of God shows up, all the covers come off. And the first time that we see people terrified is all the way back in Genesis, when Adam and Eve, they were walking in perfect intimacy with God. Satan shows up on the scene and says, you know what? You don't need intimacy with God. What you need, if you're going to be happy, is to be in charge. You call the shots. You know, you can do a much better job than God can. So what happens? They step out of that perfect intimacy with God, and they step into the realm of sin. Sin just simply means anytime I put myself or I, anytime I put myself above God or anything else, I'm in the realm of sin. And so it was at this moment that we see they were afraid of him. Look what it says. It says, but the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Why were they afraid? Because now everything was up to them. Intimacy was broken with God. They're not under his, you know, perfect love, which casts away all fear. Now, rather than finding their acceptance and in, in, in intimacy with God, their worth and their value, now their acceptance is based on their performance and their own abilities. And what happens in that place is when you don't find your affirmation from God, you have to find it somewhere. And so you become a slave to people's opinions. You become a slave to affirmation. And you become very afraid of the future because you can't control five minutes from now. And so rather than resting with God, they realize really quickly that they're not qualified for the job. Yeah. Right. That only God is qualified. Is that making sense? Yeah. And so, so the glory of God shows up. And when it does, it reveals our ugliness. Ugh. His righteousness reveals our sinfulness. Tough. His light reveals our darkness. Yeah. And this is great news. You're like, what? Sometimes before we can appreciate the good news, we have to understand the bad news. Yeah. That not only does God want intimacy with us, but we are in desperate need of intimacy with him. I'm so grateful that Christmas also reveals that God makes a way for intimacy with us. He says, I know you're scared to the shepherds. I know you're exposed in my glory. But if you look at what I'm about to show you, if you walk through this door, you're not going to be afraid anymore. Look what he says. He says, and the angel said to them, fear not, for behold. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. A Savior is born. John 3, 16 and 17, verse 17 says that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Like the good news is that Jesus didn't come as a divine ninja to destroy and dismantle everybody that's violated the law. No, he came as, as a as a spiritual coast guard mm. to step in rest, and, and rescue us from the seas of our sin, of our decay, of the wrath of God, the penalty of our sin, of our yeah. shame, wow. to pull us out of that right. and to give us rest and peace from trying to be our own savior. Mm. How awesome is that? A wow. savior is born in the city of David. But that's only good news if you recognize that you're sinful or that you realize that you are religiously exhausted. For these shepherds, they cannot make their own way to be intimate with God, so God made a way to be intimate with them and with you and I. It was good news for the shepherd that Christmas. It was good news for us. They couldn't go into the church. They couldn't go into the temple. So God says, I'm showing up. I hear you. I see you. And I want you to spend eternity with me. It's amazing because eternity, Jesus says, isn't just a destination later, as you heard me say a thousand times. Look what Jesus says. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life 
to all those you have given him. Now, this is eternal life. What is it? That they know you. Knowing God is eternal life. See, the, the, the ESV says it like this. Knowing God is not confined to intellectual knowledge. But what it does, it entails living in fellowship with God. That they know you implies an intimate relationship that involves actually knowing God as a person. So not only does God make a way, Christmas reveals that he gave it all to be intimate and close with us. God wants intimacy. God made a way and he gave it all to do what you and I could not do for ourselves. That is great news. Like He has the right to destroy anybody. But he says, no, I'm making a way at my expense. Look what it says. It says, for unto you a Savior is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. You ever been in an argument and you're the stubborn one? No, none of you. Uh, it's <laughs> the person next to you like, yeah, you do that a lot. But don't you notice that the moment somebody says, man, I'm sorry, everything isn't perfect, but it starts to heal immediately. Why? Because vulnerability creates an opportunity and a pathway for intimacy. All of a sudden, it's vulnerable because I'm saying, I'm sorry. Does anybody have a hard time saying you're sorry? Like you try to say sorry in a thousand different ways, but you'll just never say it. Yeah. Like, look what I do for you. I told you I'm sorry. No, you didn't. You didn't say it. But why does that work? It works because you and I are created in the image of God. That's why we don't have to fear. But you're saying, how can I trust him? Well, you can trust him because he is who he says he is. He is Christ the Lord. A baby wrapped in swaddling cloths. See, not just a savior, but Christ the Lord. Do you know this word Lord is the covenant name of God, Yahweh? Get this picture, the great I am, the name that is above every name, the consuming fire, the one that's sovereign over all things, yeah. the one that created all things, yes, comes as a baby. It doesn't get any more vulnerable than a child. All the defenses come down so we can actually hurt him, wound him, betray him, abuse him. Filthy in a manger. Can I just tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't get any more vulnerable than that. See, Christmas is the ultimate vulnerability. I, I love what C.S. Lewis says. He says it this way. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give to no one, not even your dog. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or the coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. So good. Like, like, why would God risk a 30% chance mortality rate? at the time, of being born through the womb of a teenage girl in one of the most complex, difficult times in all of human history, and come as a baby. Can I just tell you, it takes vulnerability to be known, and nothing is more vulnerable than a baby. And so what happens, God became fully vulnerable. Why? So he could be fully known. So good. And it was at his own expense. The great I am steps down into time, and guess what? Is betrayed by a close friend. Judas Iscariot betrays him with a kiss. He, he's falsely accused. He stands trial for something he didn't even do wrong. What is he doing? He's making a way. He, he, not only that, he was rejected by the people close to him at the time where, they needed, where he needed them the most. Like, come on, guys, couldn't you just pray with me? I'm about to die on the cross. 
Couldn't you just stay awake with me for an hour? Peter, you denied me? You don't even know me? Rejected. He was abused. They said that Jesus was beaten so badly you couldn't even recognize him as a human being. This is the God of all creation. The first and the last, the alpha and the omega. And he was humiliated. Most scholars believe that as he hung on that cross, there was no cloth. Utter humiliation. For what? Why would you become that vulnerable? For intimacy with you. And intimacy with me. See, the ultimate vulnerability is not found in what you think you're going to have to do to be vulnerable. The ultimate vulnerability that will allow you to be vulnerable is when you see that the ultimate vulnerability was found in Christmas. And because we see that he is a great high priest, that he's been through it all. Not only has he experienced all these things, but he bore the weight and the penalty of every time we've done these things to other people. Why? Intimacy. Because he wants to be close to you and to me. You say, well, Pastor Matt, what do, what do, what do I do with this? Well, let me show you. John chapter 1, verse 9 to 13. It says, the true light who gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But to all who received him, those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of blood nor of the desire or will of men, but born of God. You say, well, what's my response to this vulnerability that God has done for me? Some of you, you need to receive for the very first time the gift that God has given you in Christmas, himself. Greatest gift on the planet is him as your Lord and as your Savior. Others of you, you need to look at the Christmas story again. You're following Jesus, but you don't believe like you used to. You don't believe in his name like you used to. And so as a result, there's a little bit of a distance, and God's like, come home for Christmas. Make your home in me. In the season, in the time, just like in that first Christmas, it was, it was dark, it was complex. A Savior was born. The light has shone in the midst of the darkness. Would you stand to your feet and would you bow your heads? Maybe you're here today and you hear my voice and ask everybody to just close your eyes. And you're like, man, Pastor Matt, I know I need to get right with God. I just don't feel like I could come to him. It's good news. He's come to you. Like you thought you showed up here because you just showed up here today. But no, no, God said, I've been pursuing you. Maybe some of you need to rededicate your life. It's been a wild ride the last couple of years. It's not getting any more easy or less complex. I'm telling you, I love having the one who is sovereign over all things. Walking with him for his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So much easier with him. Not easy, but it's better and it's worth it. So if you're here today, every head bowed, every eye closed, you say, Pastor, I need to surrender my life to Jesus today. Would you slip up your hand right where you're at? Yep, I see your hand. Thank you. So good. Maybe you're online. We let us know. Just say, yep, I'm all in. Just type in the chat. I'm all in. All in so we can follow up. Anybody else that would say, that's me. I need to rededicate my life. I need to get right with God today. Come on, don't let, this, don't let this moment pass. I know it's vulnerable because you got to lift up your hand and I can see you. But it's just me, you, and God. Just lift up. Yep, I see your hand. So good. I'm just going to give another moment. Yep, I see your hand. Come on, can we pray this prayer with them, church? I, I, I'm, it's it's kind of like marriage vows. I'm going to say these words, but you just make them your own. This is between you and God. Say, Lord Jesus, let's pray with them, church. Lord Jesus, Jesus. if you're online, don't close your eyes if you're driving, but just pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, 
I need you. Thank you for being vulnerable so that I could be close. I'm dropping my guard today. I'm scared, but I'm going to trust you. Would you forgive me? Would you heal me? Would you restore me? Make me brand new today. Take the fear out of my heart. Clothe me in your love. Fill me with your spirit. I repent for my sin. And I give my life to you today. I declare you and confess you as the Lord of my life. You died and you rose so that I could be healed, set free, and close to you. I give it you everything. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen.